Hello, welcome to Bibliophiles, the show on AADL TV brought to you by the Ann Arbor District Library, where we take a few moments to discuss one book topic each episode. Uh, this week, we are discussing debut novels, which we are excited about. My name is Amanda, and I'm joined, as always, by Christopher and Lucy, and we are delighted this episode to be joined by special guest, Emily. Thank you for joining us. All right, so we are discussing debut novels. Let's dive right in. What is a book that an author wrote for the first time that we wanted to share today? Uh, Lucy, what did you bring for us? Um, so I brought a debut novel, and this author has not written anything else. This came out in February 2023, and it's called Mame, and it's by Jessica George. And it also has a very colorful, nice cover. Um, so this is the story of a 25-year-old woman living in Ghana. Her, she's the child of, I mean, living in London. She's the child of parents born in Ghana. Um, and she lives alone with her father. Her name is Maddie. Her father is 57 years old, but he has Parkinson's. And she has a brother who lives in London as well, but he just doesn't do anything to help with the father. Her mother is still married to her father, but her mother lives in Ghana because her mom has gone back and forth for Maddie's like whole life because she can make more money working on a farm that she owns in Ghana. So Maddie's situation is that she is the main caregiver for her father. She's 25 years old. And the book is called Mame because that's the nickname that Maddie was given when she was really little. In, in Twi, it means a lot of things, but in Maddie's case, it means woman. And she's been called this ever since she was a little girl. So essentially, which which she really loved, but it's also this double message of like, you are a woman, you're the caregiver for your father. You're so much more grown up than we think. You can have all this responsibility. So she's basically living this sequestered life. She goes to her job as a publishing assistant, but she's basically a glorified, like, you know, executive assistant or secretary. She doesn't get to really contribute at all. She is navigating living in London as a black woman in mostly white spaces. When she goes home to Ghana, she doesn't fit in there either. So she just sort of keeps to herself. She takes care of her father and like really takes care of him. It's not, you know, it's significant care that he requires, which is a lot for her. And that is her situation. She's pretty naive as to how anything else in the world really works because she can't have time to focus on it. And then something happens that is tragic. Her mother comes back and her mother's taking care of her father. And there's a situation and then Maddie's life changes. Her father dies. And that's not really a spoiler because it's like in the description of the book. And she's devastated, but she's also kind of feeling this freedom. So she moves out of the house. She moves in with roommates that that's the whole situation she has to kind of navigate. And she is trying to enter into like the dating world for the first time ever, but she's extremely naive. She has no references for, for how anything works. She has no one to ask. She Googles everything. And it's pretty funny. Like her Google searches are hilarious. I mean, they, they range from like how to do this care with Parkinson's to like, you know, do I have sex on the third date? Like all these things, Google is her kind of um, her advice giver because she doesn't trust her instincts because she doesn't have any. So she meets a man she really likes and she thinks he's going to take good care of her. Again, she doesn't trust her instincts. So she, she gets into like a rocky situation there. And so it's really this story of her um, like trying to live her own life and trying to grow up, but also trying to find her place within her family that is still like mommy, but in a different definition in a way. So she's not, she can sometimes be the child. And um, it, it was billed as sort of like Bridget Jonesy because it's told in this first person and it's, it's pretty funny and she's very like forthright and tells you all these details, but I would say that it's not really like that at all. And it definitely gets into some more serious issues about like, um, family and grief and even uh, situations between couples. And then um, it's also just, it, it, it's it got a great voice and I really liked it. And um, yeah, so that's really all I can say about that. That is Mame by Jessica George. It was a quick read, but it was really enjoyable and it had a lot of depth. Uh, Emily, 
what do you have? Well, since uh, for the library, I select and maintain our kids fiction section, I thought I would bring a middle grade novel. Uh, it's called Skating on Mars by Caroline Huntoon. Uh, it's about Mars, who is a 12 year old. Uh, they're in seventh grade, which already gives you, you know, it's not easy being a seventh grader. Uh, but on top of the usual seventh grade challenges, uh, Mars recently uh, lost her father. He passed away. And um, Mars also realizes, I believe I just misgendered them because Mars realizes that they are uh, non-binary. And so kind of juggling all that. But the through piece of this is that skating. So, so much of Mars's identity is as a figure skater. And so they are practicing before and after school. Um, and that is really how they see their biggest sense of self. Uh, and coming out as non-binary, uh, Mars got a ton of support from their mother, uh, their older sister, Heather, and their best friend, Libby, who is in eighth grade. Um, and I thought this was a really great representation in a book of the most important thing about the story and about Mars is not their gender identity, though it does play a big role in it. It really just shows this is the way that this this person lives their life and is a great representation of that. Um, but what gives the book its real struggle is that ice skating is a real gendered, gendered world. It's very much you are competing as a woman skater or you're competing as a man skater. Um, and Mars who is in some ways very supportive of them choosing their own path and getting to create their own routine. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they aren't getting that step-by-step -step of this is what you should do next. And then Mars meets Xander, who is a, I believe he is in eighth grade. He's a very aggressive skater, a strong personality. Um, and he challenges Mars to beat him in skating. And Mars is a very, very competitive character as well. And so decides, you know, really, even though we could compare our scores with me skating in the women's division and Xander skating in the men's dis division, I don't want there to be any question when I crush him and am the best skater. Uh, so that means I really need to skate in the men's division. Uh, and so that sort of becomes the main through point of the story is Mars figuring out how they can manage to skate as a boy. But of course, it's a middle grade novel, which means you get a lot of other little tasty things in it. Like there's a little bit of romance with uh, uh, Mars just noticing this other this other young woman skater. Um, there's a lot of really good representation of um, some of the challenges with friendship. Uh, Libby is a wonderful, great best friend, but Libby's in eighth grade and Mars is in seventh grade. And so you get some of those questions of, gosh, Libby is making friends with the cool kids. Am I going to be replaced? Um, and all of this, all of these pieces are told in this beautifully tight little book. Um, it's not very long. It's middle grade, uh, but it it doesn't feel rushed. There's just no wasted word. Uh, Huntoon is an excellent writer. They do such a nice job of representing real and true characters. There's a lot of humor throughout, even though uh, the, the drama is not necessarily funny. Um, and then as an added bonus, uh, Huntoon is an Ann Arbor author. So the book is based in Michigan. And while it does not specify the town, it definitely does have some Ann Arbor vibes. Uh, so I would highly recommend it. I'll also say this is their debut, but it went very well. And so they've already got a second book that's coming out uh, this May. Uh, and I got to read an advanced copy of it. And it's wonderful. So if y'all read and fall in love with Mars like I did, great news. Uh, uh, their next book, Linus and Etta Could Use a Win, although it doesn't take place in the same universe, does have the same humor and characters with heart. And I really loved it. And I recommend it to you, even if you are not a middle grader, uh, middle grade reader, because uh, like I said, characters are written in a true way that adults can enjoy as well, especially because all of us also had to go through middle grade years and a lot of those challenges, uh, may they, though they may look different decades down the line, the feelings are the same. So that again is Skating on Mars by Caroline Huntoon. How about you, Christopher? What'd you bring? Well, I read a book that deeply, deeply affected me. 
It's called My Stupid Intentions by Bernardo Zanoni, and it was translated from the Italian by Alex Andres. This book tells the story of Archie, who is a Martin. A Martin is like a weasel related to a mink. And if you think basically about Watership Down, the kind of sentient animal characters that you have in that, you have somewhat of an idea of, of what happens in my stupid intentions so the book tells the story of archie who really wavers between uh wrestling with his own bestial nature and these kind of glimpses into self-awareness in one scene he's out petting all of his favorite chickens and he has to kill one of them and there's a moment where he hesitates, and then when he takes the head off his favorite, he realizes how much he wants to kill all of them in this frenzy of bloodlust. So it really is this kind of wrestling between his two natures. The book is full of so much brutality and cruelty, um, and yet it has these heartbreaking scenes of loneliness and insight into what it means to be alive and wrestling with mortality. The, the whole story is his life from a childhood and his death just a few short years later. Along the way, he somewhat befriends other animals. He learns how to read and write, and he ends up chronicling his own life uh, and his own thoughts and his own ideas of what God is. It's a very fast read. It is fascinating. Uh, I just absolutely loved it. Um, there's another scene I just want to mention where he's Re recounting the story of how he fell in love slash infatuation or lust with this other Martin. And they do eventually get together. And then he's struggling with his ideas of fatherhood, how he can't relate to his children or his, his mate. And they separate, and then he lives the rest of his life always wondering what happened to his family. And at the same time, he realizes, even if they were back here right now, no matter how much I'm longing to see them, I would spurn them and have no love for them at all. So it's a complicated, wonderful, beautiful, sad and brutal book. And I hope the author goes on to write more. I was kind of all over the place, but I hope that gives you an idea of my stupid intentions. <laughs> well, Amanda, what did you read? Um, so the book I chose is called The Silent Patient, and it's written by Alex Michaelides, and it was published in 2019. They do have one other book that was published after that, and there's another one that's actually coming out, I think, in January of early 2024, so I look forward to that one. I've only read this one. Um, so the book was published as his first novel and it, it debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And it has gone on to sell more than six and a half million copies worldwide, um, which is great because I really love this book. This book is a psychological thriller and it was actually recommended to me by my two teenage nieces. And I read it this summer I listened to an audiobook and I had the awkward time of trying to finish the last like hour of it while I was on a camping trip. Long story short, I just needed a moment to pause and finish the book like alone and not at midnight in a camper. Um, anyways, the book, uh, it's a thriller. I do like reading a really good thriller. So I was happy to find this one. And it is about a woman named Alicia. She's a pretty well-known painter and she is married to a pretty high profile photographer and they live in London or outside of London and they live a pretty, you know, lovely looking life from the outside. And then one night when her husband gets home from a long day of work, she shoots him, um, killing him. I think she shoots him five times. She kills him. And then she refuses to say another word ever again. Hence the silent patient. Um, so 
after this, her refusal to speak or explain about anything that happened or why she did it or what was going on in their lives, it makes her, it gives her even more notoriety than she already had as a painter. Um, so the silent patient, Alicia, ends up in a facility where she's being treated by multiple therapists to try to get out of her to make her speak to explain what, what happened that night. And there's one therapist in particular, Theo, who just really gets absorbed into her and wants to hear her story. And he becomes obsessed with like wanting to be the one to like get her to speak and explain what happened in this horrific event, why she killed her husband. Um, and he works really, really hard with her. So the way the book is written, it's alternating chapters of Alicia's voice and then Theo's voice. So you get this, the book slowly paints a picture of what was happening leading up to and at the time of the murder, as well as like present day. And I really like it when books are able to do that effectively. And it works really well in a thriller. And I liked how it was done in this one because you, it starts kind of slow, it kind of builds up, but it's still suspenseful. And it is a thriller and it kind of takes you all over the place. And it's really cool having these two different points of view kind of come together. And then there's a really awesome, like it's a really fabulous ending and I really enjoyed it. And I did really like the audio book and since the book does start kind of slower, you still have these like beautiful like English voices, um, one for Alicia, one for Theo. And I really like that point of view from these two speakers as well. It's just really well done audio book. Um, and the end was so fast paced. And again, I just needed more time to like spend with it rather than trying to like squeeze it in at like midnight in a camper when it was just like not happening. Um, so I really liked it. If you're into thrillers, I do recommend it. I have not, I mean, it's popular, so maybe the whole world has read it, even though it came out in 2019. Um, I just read it this summer, but I have not read his two follow-ups. And for some reason, I did not check out the second, but the third one piqued my interest. And I look forward to, to grabbing that one from the library in the future. So that is my debut pick, The Silent Patient by Alex Nicolides. What do we all have to say for final thoughts on debut authors or any anything we read today? Keep writing. <laughs> Keep writing. Yeah. One note I'll say is that when I'm seeking out books, I don't, I personally don't seek out books that are debut authors, but when I grab a book and read it and really enjoy it, and I was like, whoa, that was their first book. It just gives that book an extra punch to me and it piques my interest of wanting to like look them up again. What else have they written? How do they do such a banger of a first novel? And then there's also those cases where they don't write another book again or the other books aren't quite as great as that first one. So it's, it's a pretty interesting world of, you know, putting out that first book and how it's received in the world. I'll be curious what you think of uh, the second thriller, because that's where I feel like oftentimes debut authors have for thrillers have this great story that they've been thinking of for years and they've got it all down. And then they have to put out another one one year later, maybe two years later uh, when it gets that much success. So report back. Yeah, especially like that one was that was a huge hit. Like, how do you like as an author, like, how do you handle your own like emotions and thoughts of like putting out another one and unleashing it into the world? <laughs> I guess it's true with anything like a movie or like music, any sort of like art piece you put out there. How do you follow up a, a hit? You know. All right. Well, I guess that's it for us today discussing debut novels. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Bibliophiles. And thank you, Emily, for joining us today. So we've got another recommendation. Um, and we will see you next time.